From our last video, we made these vast majestic landscapes, but it's still kind of empty. I think it'd look a lot better if we added some life. But how do we get here? I mean, I can make a model real quickly, but without a brain, it doesn't really do anything. So let's pretend just for now that all our entities are tic tacs. We can start by placing these tic tacs in a test environment, and we can make them walk in, I guess, random directions. Okay, so that's done. Now I guess I can make them chase me by walking in my direction. They're kind of stupid. Luckily, Unity allows us to stuff a little brain into them, known as a nav mesh. This allows them to perform some basic mesh based pathfinding to reach their destination. Now they can dodge obstacles and... But there's a problem. They're kind of glued to the ground, meaning I can't push them off a cliff. Which I mean, what are we even accomplishing at that point? Also, if I forcefully spawn any of them off the ground, they kind of sorta lose their brains. Technically speaking, this is because their pathfinding works on the mesh. So yeah, underneath, the each triangle can border at most three other triangles. From one angle, we can identify how we other triangles are positioned in the zone currently deployed. We can also find other triangles and have to cross by walking. There's got to be a simpler way. This convoluted solution for meshes is kind of overkill, given that we have a simple voxel representation. So let's go back to that. Because the shape of the terrain kind of depends not only on the amount of terrain at these points, but also the density of its adjacent points, it's particularly difficult, or rather expensive, to check if a hitbox can fit through a given region. But we can define a cheaper check. If all 9 of these points are individually above ground, then no matter what these points are, a hitbox of this size can always fit through. Moreover, if we want this tic-tac to walk on the ground, then we also require that any of these points are underground, so that it doesn't just walk off a cliff on its own. Then, based on our tic-tac size, we can partition the world into voxels our tic-tac can stand on, and voxels it can't. Also, we can infer that if it can stand on point A, and it can stand on point B, and A and B are adjacent, then it should be able to move from one point to the other. With these assumptions, this allows us to perform a search algorithm from any point to any other point in the world. We'll be using A star, which is like a heuristic flood fill. To do this, we construct a microheap here and visited bitmap to optimize data locality and instruction count. We then use this heap to perform a best first search, calling our verify profile to test if our current position is walkable, and finish the search if we reach the end. Keep in mind, we also need to keep track of our parents' directions so we can retrace our path later. We are able to calculate the heuristic score for each visited point through adding this function, which returns the minimum possible remaining distance, with this factor, which counts the distance of each step along our already traveled path. Finally, we can call this function, which reaches our steps from the end and reverses it before returning the path. Now these animals' brains will stay with them even if I push them off a cliff. But not all entities need to walk on the ground. If we try to fit a tic-tac brain into a bird, then it just becomes a bit bird brain. Instead, we need to remove that other condition we defined before. So let's allow each entity to define its own list of conditions, one for each point in its hitbox. This allows us to define what is walkable for each entity uniquely, so fish can only swim underwater, and birds can only fly in the sky. Now that they have brains, can we make them do something other than chasing me? <laughs> For starters, let's separate them into two groups and make one group chase the other. The red team needs the ability to find the closest blue member, so we'll create this archery-based bounding volume hierarchy, which allows us to perform area lookups quickly. Here's a cool visualization of what those words mean. Now let the carnage begin. This is pretty funny, but they should get tired at some point. But that is kind of difficult when their brains are C blue, chase blue, and C red, chase red. So let's define a more complex brain, like this. So their brains are made up of a bunch of states, almost like it's a machine made of states. We could call it a statement. Oh. Explained simply, if a tic tac is chasing another tic tac and it gets tired, then it'll go back to wandering around aimlessly. And if it gets hungry enough, it'll start chasing other tic tacs again. Yeah, now it's getting a bit more interesting, so let's raise the stakes and create Dude. The rules are pretty much the same as before with the blue team and red team, but if you're on the blue team, don't get caught or else you DIE! 
Okay, but this game of hide and seek seems to be a bit unfair for the blue team. Why are we still here? Just to suffer. So let's give them a win condition. If a red seeker doesn't catch and kill a blue team member in a certain amount of time, then they die. Now this is fun. But eventually this game will end. Either the red tic tacs are fast enough and go around killing all the blue tic tacs and then die of starvation, or the blue tic tacs outmaneuver the red, outlasting them and then get to live on peacefully. UNACCEPTABLE! So let's allow them to procreate. If two red tic tacs who have a high enough kill count meet together, they can increase their body count and create a little red murder baby. Likewise, if two blue tic tac, what's a good analogy, work the fields, they can earn coins, which they can then trade in to buy their own Nepo babies. Now the carnage goes on indefinitely. <laughs> Actually, watching them move around like this is pretty mesmerizing. Oh, also we are remodel and color these Tic Tacs now. Finally, we have something close to an ecosystem. Now let's add some more animal variants and make an entirely new ecosystem for each unique biome, each equipped with their own unique models and behavior because I'm sure that'll be easy. <laughs> Why did I do this? Considering how the code is actually written, there's only several files for all the animal's logic. These files expose many settings that we can specialize for each entity through Unity's inspector, allowing many different entities to utilize a singular source script. If you're wondering what these files are, they describe soaring behavior useful for immersive bird flocks and fish schools. Underneath, their state machines are pretty much the same, except instead of random walking, they invoke the spoid function. Also for pack animals, when attacking, they'll notify nearby boys to group on the same enemy, meaning it's very easy to get swarmed if you're unlucky. Anyhow, these animals are cool and all, but after a while it can get boring. If a fox starts chasing a rabbit, then 9 out of 10 times the rabbit is already dead unless the fox falls down a hole. But what if we have a really fast rabbit and a really slow fox? So let's add some genetics. A rather simple way to do this is to take, for example, this setting which controls the animal's speed. Rather than making this setting a fixed number, we can make it fall between a range, and the actual value in this range is decided by a floating point we'll designate a gene. So each parameter in this list has a corresponding gene, and put together they form a genome. We can start by giving everyone a random genome and see how it goes. Now we need to define a way to combine these genes. A simple way we'll do this is to iterate through every gene, and for each one, pick at random one parent to take from. Then afterwards, we'll add some random mutations. Let's test it out! Mew, 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 mew. Okay, so because most of these genes have an obvious better value, through natural selection, all these values get pushed to their optimums and we lose all variety. To solve this, we can introduce some normalization by making strong genes diminish the strength of all other genes. Simply put, if a horse is fast, it cannot have a lot of health. The horse is forced to choose between being fast or having a lot of health. Finally, we have realistic genes. I'm sure Mendel would be proud. Looking around, we can watch animals chasing each other and appreciate the intricacy of ecosystems in our world. Until they start looking in our direction, 